I hate this picture. I really do. Uh, please walk away. Go. Thank you. Excellent. So very happy to be here. It's my first time, no, actually second time in Budapest, but the first time speaking in Budapest. So I'm very, very privileged and happy to be here. Um, very impressed with the organization. It looks amazing. I can't see anybody, just a stream and beam of light. But I have to tell you one thing right away. The things you're going to see in the next 45 minutes, you will not be able to unsee. And I don't take any credit or responsibility of what happens next in your projects, all right? So with this in mind, let's go. Now we have a lot of stuff to do. I think that this slide has a total of um, uh, 565 slides, so we better start now, right? Now, so this talk is about new adventures in responsive design. I know that most of you, when you're designing or building, of course, it will be responsive anyway. And so what my job is, is to kind of explore the uncharted territory, not only from the design perspective, but also from the development perspective, how we can kind of push the boundaries and explore something new. Now, my name is Willy. I was born in Minsk, Belarus, moved to Germany, traveled a lot around Germany, and ended up in Lithuania now. So I travel with air all the time, right? Thank you for that, by the way. Um, I co-founded this little website a while back in 2006, Smashing Magazine. And we've been working on a redesign for the last 18 months. And along the way, we had to rediscover our personality and what branding means for us. And I probably will be sharing some stories about that too. But this little website is going to look slightly different starting from late October this year, well, in a couple of weeks, which is going to be like this. But don't worry. Uh, if you don't like red, you'll find the fancy color switcher Right, right, right here, right? So you can actually turn it off as well. So that might be nicer, all right? Now, this talk is not about this, but lessons we learned while building it. I want to kind of cover briefly four different things, and I probably will be focusing a bit more on the first two, and then if we have time, on the last two. So we'll be looking into storytelling and patterns, and then kind of finishing off with some e-commerce things, lessons learned, and strategic part of how we can approach designing today. And I want to start by going a little bit back in time and thinking specifically about what storytelling means when we're designing today, right? For me, it's all about embedding a personality into our designs and making it a, bit, a little bit less generic and a bit more unique in a way, right? And there is a main problem that we all, I think, struggle at some point. At least I work with many companies as a consultant organizations, and it feels like very often the design process feels weird and complicated because it involves people and systems and organizations which are weird and complicated. I'm not sure about you here in Hungary, but it's totally true in Germany. And the reason for it is because many managers tend to see a creative process, be it a design process or development process or marketing plan or anything in between, as a very linear process, a very linear iterative process, which it is not. We think that it often starts somewhere, right? And then you just keep iterating, iterating, iterating until you hit the finish line. And I think this is misleading and very dangerous to think about it this way. It looks much more like this, where you kind of have lots of branches and you explore and diverge and try to figure out what it is that you're doing, right? So you start somewhere and at some point go and you explore all kinds of options and at some point you'll be hitting a dead end. And these dead ends, right, are very expensive because you have to reroute and find another way to you know, solve a problem. Now, this is why we tend to rely on things that used to work in the past. Right? Many of you will have seen this before. How many, or which one of these two possible websites are you currently designing? Because there is one on the left, and there is one on the right, and there is nothing in between. Now, the only difference is sometimes you find a carousel on the top, and sometimes you find a carousel at the bottom. That's the only difference between the websites we're designing. Anybody relates to that? Uh, some people, okay, right? Now, maybe, just maybe, you've been focusing a bit too much on pixels over the last few years, right? How many of you had these conversations in the past, let's say, a few months? Okay, so what about border radius? 11 pixels or 13 pixels? 10 pixels. 12, and then kind of reverting back to 10 pixels two months later. How many of you had this, this all similar conversation at some point? Does it really matter? If it's 10 pixels, 12 pixels, 13 pixels, 15 pixels, 20 pixels, maybe it doesn't matter at all. So maybe we're pushing pixels a bit too hard, kind of forgetting sometimes the big picture, right? 
And the reason for it is because we have to you know, progress fast and we don't have much time to stack, so we tend to rely on things that used to work in the past and we tend to rely on best practices. And everybody likes good practices. When you talk to people like, what do you want to do? You want fast website. You don't want parallax. You don't want carousel. You don't want horrible navigation. You want something that's easy and simple and don't make people think, right? Maybe it's time to stop making people think, after all. We have these rules, and these rules restrict us too much. You should not define the line height in pixels. That's not cool. That's not 2017, right? You should not base it breakpoints on device sizes. That's not cool. Don't do that. Cool people don't do it, right? Or you should not take the name of the Lord performance in vain, right? This is not how things work on the web. You should care about performance, right? And of course you should, but maybe we're focusing too much on it. Because where does it leave us as creatives, as designers, right? Well, somebody comes to you and wants you to create a new project, and so you have some content and navigation, and you open up your sketch or Photoshop or whatever it is you're using, and you start designing. But then somebody says, no, 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 no. This is not how things work. You should not start looking at the desktop first. Start mobile first, right? Can we turn on the sound? It would be, make it a bit more dramatic. Maybe. No? That's way better. No, 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 don't start desktop first, you should start mobile first, it forces you to focus and rethink and kind of focus on the what impo most important thing. So you say, okay, so I'm going to change the canvas, make it smaller, and I know this fabulous, magnificent, magical symbol that you can always use for navigation. It's universal, everybody knows it, right? So you're going to put it in the right upper corner, the hamburger icon, and put the navigation in there, right? But then somebody comes to you and says, no, no, no. no. That's too much. That's a bit thank you. That's too much. No, no, no. Don't use hamburger icons. Why? Well, if you have something important to show, just show it. If you have an add to cart button, you will not hide it behind the menu. If you have an important section, you will not hide it behind the menu. Just show it. And you say, okay, I'm going to show it, but then I still have this content to organize, right? So it goes right under navigation, right? But then someone comes to you and tells you, no, 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 no. This is not how things are supposed to be, right? Do not put important stuff below the fold. Right? Then you say, okay, so I'm going to keep it above the fold, and I'll have a fabulous pattern. Fabulous pattern that everybody loves and enjoys and you know, everybody uses, which is a carousel, so I can keep the content above the fold. And of course, do not use a damn carousel, right? because they're not cool. So this is a creative process 2017. Right? And that's very sad, because maybe we can do a bit more with this, right? Now, if we look into print, and I know that print isn't web, and web isn't print, but we can learn lessons from the print and apply them meaningfully to the web. You can find lots of really beautifully, beautiful artifacts of layout and of design in print. This is an article on architecture, and yeah, it looks like a sturdy, nice, beautiful grid. It's great. And you can totally replicate it if you wanted today with CSS grid layout on the web, but instead, we tend to template it in a way into whatever we have available on the site, right? Plugging in a lot of navigation and advertising and everything in it, right? So maybe we can rethink it a little bit. But for me, the task that I asked myself like one and a half years ago was how can we do it in a meaningful way? We can go nuts and create all kinds of crazy layouts, but it takes time. It's expensive. Not everybody can afford it. Two months ago or so, I attended a conference, and Morgan Smuller, a Danish designer who is 19 years old, uh, spoke about the art direction on the web. And specifically, he said a couple of things that stuck with me for quite some time. And over the last two months, I've been referring back to those, um, to his quote, quite a lot. He said, if you want to stand out today, because you know, we are all good designers, maybe not all of us are great designers or remarkably talented designers, but we're all pretty good. But still, if we want to be better than everybody else, we need to be really, really great. And we need to put some effort in this work, right? So if we want to stand out today to outperform our competitors, we need to delight customers with a remarkable design and a unique, charming personality. Be slow and mindful with an unprecedented attention to detail. Now, when I hear of unprecedented, I hear expensive and time-consuming, right? But still, the things that he said, this stuff, really stuck with me. We should under-promise and over-deliver. Capture attention and guide it skillfully. On the web today, it all boils down to one single thing, outstanding storytelling to great art direction. Now, let me ask you something. 
Can you think of a website that was so memorable, or so remarkable, or so mesmerizing and amazing that you still think of it as of now? When you think, wow, that was a website. Can you think of a website that was memorable for you, like within the last month or so? And we say, wow, that was a website. Hmm. Well, hopefully not Facebook uh, or something of that kind. But should websites be memorable at all? Is it, does it matter? Are we just drawing invisible pixels that should kind of fade in oblivion in a couple of years and everybody should forget about them? Well, if you're designing a product or building a product, of course it's important because it's also part of branding, right? So if you want to embed personality, you probably want to do it because you want to be memorable. You want people to connect with you in some way, right? Now, there is a website that stuck with me for quite some time. And when I look at and think about storytelling in that direction, this is probably what most of you will be thinking of as well. Can you imagine how much time and effort and resources went into building and designing it? Right? This is a website dedicated to data art movement. Um, so like the, it's like a homage to the 100 years of data movement. And of course, the website has to reflect it, so it has this personality, which is kind of weird and awkward and kind of strange. It's all fully responsive, by the way, as well. And it's like an, a game, and it's tons of parallax things, and a lot of movement, and a lot of parallaxing, and a lot of everything, right? Uh, illustration work, just imagine how much effort would go into this. We cannot afford creating something like this every other week, every other month. It must have cost like literally tens of thousands of euros or dollars or whatever, right? Just think about the complexity of this stuff, right? So for me, this is not, I mean, this is not something I can pull off, right? So I was thinking we need to find a framework that would make building something memorable much easier than this process, right? Because this is like, this is a one-off. Not everybody can do this. And when I specifically think about storytelling in a more global scale, I think about things like, you know, this maybe, the three bears, the fairy tale, or maybe something like this, the red, whatever thing, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I forgot how it's called, right? Or maybe something like this, if you're coming from Asia, right? Because this is very famous there. But then, not this. This is for me not storytelling. If you look into the interface of Uber, I don't see any storytelling here. I'm not feel connected to it at all. And I asked myself just a while back, how is it that I'm not connected to Uber at all? I mean, you know of Uber. I know that Uber doesn't exist here in Budapest, um, but you know of it. I'm not connected to the brand at all. So if there was a service in my city, which was like five cents cheaper on average, I would jump to that service from Uber, away from Uber, right away. No connection, no emotional connection at all. I don't feel like I'm, I want to stay with Uber, right? But Somebody has to actively pay me money, so I move away from MailChimp. I'm so happy to send them a paycheck every month. I would love to send more if I can. And literally, it's really, really difficult for me to move away, right? And don't get me wrong, I'm not stupid. It's not like it's all about the chimp and, you know. But it has a personality embedded in it. Every single part of it, be it the voice and tone of the interface, be it the design, be it error messages, everything has this personality embedded in it. And I would even create something that's just humane. This product feels humane to me, unlike Uber. So they would create these books, color books, for children to paint or to color, and it doesn't have any advertising. There is no mention of, hey, look at how awesome MailChimp is. Hey, buy our products, by the way. Hey, we are an amazing email company. Email is boring. Who cares about email? But they turn this story and kind of embed this story into the product, right? So these books contain really beautiful copy, like, hi, I'm Freddy. It's fun to be me. Is it fun to be you? There is no way you're going to answer this question in a negative way. I'm like, no, I'm boring. I'm so boring, it's like, you know. And then it goes on and on. I love eating bananas for breakfast. Me too. So here's the connection right there, right? And it keeps going and going and going. And just distribute them for free on the streets to everybody, right? And eventually, one of these people might have heard of MailChimp, and they feel connected, right? Um, even things like this, I love being me. Do you love being you? No, I'm, I'm just horrible. I don't like me at all, right? This is not how people react. So this is a really, really cool copy, and it's just done well, right? So this quote by this guy stuck with me for quite some time. And I want to inspire you to think about your process in a little bit slightly different framework that we developed over time. 
So I want to share you through a story of Tijuana Flats. Tijuana Flats is a Mexican a chain of Mexican restaurants in the US. And they have a very particular visual style, visual identity. Now, if you walk into a restaurant, this looks like this, right? I mean, you, this is like zombies and crazy like blood and stuff all over the place, right? And you might not like it, or you might like it. That doesn't matter that much. What matters is they have this style, right? This is the thing. And these paintings or these walls are huge. Now, look at the people there, right? These are the people in those things, in those restaurants, right? And those things are really huge. Now, every three or four months, they would hire professional graffiti artists to come and repaint to continue the story, right? Or maybe just change it a little bit to freshen things up, right? So that's quite an effort. And so, of course, because this is a part of the story, the menu that they have should reflect this story as well, right? So the restaurant menu kind of designed in the same way, and so should the website be, right? And in fact, this is the website. This is, well, you know, it reflects the identity very well. And I think if you were a developer, think about how you would build it. That would probably be quite an effort, right? Um, and so in the spirit of 2017, in the spirit of performance and flat design, and everybody going away from horrible things like carousel and parallax and everything that we all hate, right? They decided to do a Big Bang redesign, moving away from this to this. I don't know about you, but this picture, which just had nothing at all, just some texture in the background and a couple of buttons, it's much faster. Performance-wise, it's great. It's no parallax, no web fonts. I mean, this is just images, right? Great. But there is so much loss between the previous example and this one. I would love to be more websites to have a personality like this, even although they're slower than this, which I cannot connect anything with. Blomberg was kind of struggling with the same thing. They were not seen as anything special. They were not seen as kind of unique company with a unique brand, with a unique identity. You know, Bloomberg, MSNBC, Financial Times, it's all the same, right? So they decided to find their voice. And again, most of people will hate it, but it serves its purpose. Now, here's the website it designed for the design conference, right? Uh, when was the last time you used the marquee tag? Today, maybe? Maybe five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Maybe it's time to rethink and use it again, right? They actually have a fallback for browsers not supporting marquee, which is kind of cool, I think. But the idea is, well, let's be playful. Let's just try and do something, right? So this is a crazy layout, and I guess that most of you will hate it, right? And you might think it's a bad design, but it's not a bad design, because design is all about solving problems and communication. It does both, and it served its purpose, because they sold out within six days. So you might hate it, but it's still a very good design. And in fact, they hired a group of designers that were, who were given the freedom to do whatever they wanted. And oh yes, they did whatever they wanted. They went all the way overboard, creating crazy, absolutely crazy layouts, which are so not 2017, right? Just totally breaking out of the rules altogether. And the thing you're going to see next, it's like, yeah, that, you will never be able to unsee. Are you ready for this? Like, that wasn't really like, yes, from two people. Like, yeah, you have to be ready for it. This is something that you will never forget. This is a feature on Elon Musk and his ongoing projects in Tesla. Ready? So for those of you who are sitting in the back, maybe can't, uh, don't see it now. This is wow. This is like, uh, for me personally, it's like going back in time to 1998, where you have all kind of floating things around you, and you have animated GIFs, and everything is just wow, right? And data visualization is a bit funky, I would say at least, right? And this is probably not something that you would build. But for them, you know, what is it about? When you're being very honest, it's about, you know, readership, traffic, getting some kind of reputation, getting some kind of branding. This is one of the heaviest features they created for that year. And that was heavily, like, it got a lot of traffic, right? So in that way, again, that served its purpose. And some of you might have seen this before. It's not something like groundbreaking and new. You'll find something like this you know, happening all the time. This is a new Dropbox rebrand. Some of you might have seen it, where it just feels like it goes overboard, right? It's just, wow, right? So this is an attempt 
to kind of embed this personality into your design, kind of find your own voice and tone. And I don't want to say that this is bad or this is good. I'm just saying that everybody's trying something very hard. But maybe it's time to really think a bit more subtle or something a bit more subtle and more humble of how to approach the same thing. Because this is a question that we ask ourselves, right? Another interesting um, story is the Hans Bringer Hotel story. Now, how many of you are familiar with Hans Bringer Hotel story? Oh, this is going to blow your socks off. So, here's the problem. Hans Brinker is a hotel in Amsterdam, and it's not a good hotel, okay? It's not a good hotel. So if, you're not, if you don't have a good hotel, you will have issues selling tickets, right? So they had this issue, and they had to fix this issue somehow. They had two options. Option number one, you know, let's make it better. No, not an option, right? Because they didn't have the money and resources to make it better. Option number two, let's make it look better. Mm, well you know, what can you do? It looks pretty bad and, you know, you don't get like five, star, uh, five stars on TripAdvisor. You're lucky if you're getting two, right, or three. So that was not, a, not an issue. Or, you know, you're shut down because, you know, so what do you do next? It was not an option either because they had a long-term contract with the house and stuff. They thought, okay, so let's do something, right? So everybody's talking about design products, like design-driven uh, companies, so let's be a design-driven company. So they hired a professional designer who is not professional and not a designer. He was a stand-up comedian, and he was paid exactly one burrito for the job, but he was given the freedom again to express himself. So he thought, okay, now it's a bad hotel, right? So we can't make it a good hotel. So what if we make it the worst hotel experience in the world? What if we try to sell the bad hotel by being honest and making things worse than they are? So people actually want to explore what a really, 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 really horrible hotel experience could be. So they created this website. Guess what, by the way? They're expanding to Lisbon now because they're sold out within you know, weeks, right? And the website obviously totally reflects this horribleness, whatever you want to call it, right? So everything is kind of off. There is no proper typography. It's all a bit strange. They didn't want to hire a professional photographer. They actually specifically asked some of the neighbors of neighbors, whatever, to do some photos um, because you know, they didn't want it to look too professional. God forbid, right? So the photos, right, <laughs> and the stories they're telling on the side kind of reflect that identity. Again, you will hate it and it's all against off and you might be like having some heart attack right now. I'm sorry about that if you see this, right? But but yeah, it kind of tells the story that they want to tell in a nice, genuine way. This is a, what it's all about. It's genuine experience, right? And you know, sometimes you say, you know, let's do this or let's not do that. One example for that would be social media buttons, right? You don't put Facebook-like buttons. They're horrible for performance, right? Or let's replace them with something else. Well, you don't use them at all or you go overboard, right? And you use 20 or 30 of them <laughs> because you can, right? And so this is kind of the part of the story. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying let's break everything and make everything horrible. I hope you appreciate the hover effect on the cursor here. That's a bit weird. And this website is actually quite inaccessible, so it's, it's definitely not a good example of doing this. But we can make it a bit more subtle. You don't need to go overboard. All these examples are you need a grand idea, you need to have a grand resources to make it all work. No, you don't. Because you can make it much more humble. This is the same thing like in this previous example now, but a bit more humble where you can drag things around. There's an exhibition, a museum website. You know, you can pull it off. There's, there's nothing fancy going on there. Uh, it's just the same thing, just applied in the context where it fits, right? Oh, you know, we'll also talk about pop-ups being this horrible, horrible thing. I like a good pop-up. This, to me, is the best pop-up experience I had in years, and I wish every single website had it. It's really super annoying, but it's delightfully annoying, right? For me, it feels like, why not? This is a hotel website, they, it's kind of, again, it just fits in with the story that they're telling, right? And sometimes we can be a bit more playful, right? Remember those things where you have to tap in when you're born to in order to access the site, like a whiskey website or anything of that kind, right? You can be playful with it too. You could say, you know, so are you 21? You can lie if you want to or not. And now if you clicked no once, like, hmm, Oh, that's too bad. Well, are you at least 18? <laughs> no. Hmm. 17? No. No way you're going to click yes at this point, right? You're not making this easy. Jesus Christ. 13? 
Hmm, feels like I want to click yes, but I will not. What the shit? If you are not at least six, we are going to have serious problems. <laughs> and it keeps going and going and going. And there is a no yes button anymore, right? Just keeps going. And then eventually you're like, okay, whatever. So they just make it a really pleasant experience. The same thing goes for really boring things. Think. Now, this is the first exercise we always do. Think about the most boring element you have on the site. Now, what could be more boring than the title form field, right? Um, well, this is not a, uh, nobody gets excited about a title attribute. I mean, I hope. That would be very strange, right? So one of the first exercises we do is let's find the most boring thing and try to maybe make it a bit more interesting, something that everybody will stumble upon. Right? Sometimes you are serious, you're like a banking website, you cannot pull it off. So then we say, okay, let's try to rethink the experience. Right? Now, what if you, I think about the project you're working on right now. Okay? So what if you had to redesign it, but you couldn't use any rectangles or circles? What would you do? Everything is a rectangle. Every single thing on the web is a rectangle. Whenever we design something, it's always a box. And don't get me started about border radius. Border radius does not make a rectangle something else, right? It's still a rectangle. So the first thing that people come up with when they say no rectangles, no circles, is what? Triangles, right, because there is nothing else, right? It's rectangle, a circle, or triangle. Everything is a triangle, a circle, or rectangle, right? Or two rectangles or more. Oh, we have X, that's nice, right? But. What if you had to break out of it? Now, all of a sudden, when you're forced to have, let's say, five minutes to come up with a concept that doesn't include all those elements, you will have to think about something else. Now, what is not a rectangle, not a circle, and not a triangle? Is there anything that's not one of those things? Well, that was not very convincing, in a way. There is a lot of stuff, everything around us, everything that's natural is never perfect. You will never find a perfect triangle anywhere, right? Think about, you know, we can have any kind of shape to this PG, any kind of shape, anything, like literally anything. We can have white space is not one of those, and um, letters are not one of those. VR, AR, sound, all this stuff. There are so many things we can use, right? We just tend to maybe just, we tend to rely on things that used to work in the past. Right? And it's not that we are not going to use rectangles and circles in the project, of course we will, but it really forces you to think twice about how you're designing this experience. Right? And coming back to this boring attribute, now, you know, very often it exists only because marketing people wants, want to spam us, right? telling us, you know, we want to send you a product because you're female or, or male. Well, make it a bit more interesting. So it doesn't have to be just Mr. and Mrs. Go overboard. Maybe you'd like to be a princess today, or maybe you'd like to be a lieutenant, a lieutenant commander, maybe field marshal lord. How do you feel about squadron leader, which is my favorite, right? You can go and use it all. Why not, right? But of course, sometimes not everybody can again pull this off. So you could just play with visuals, obviously creating some kind of style. We have a consistency, right? Where every single box is 3D box, and it has a kind of this retro funky style. It looks great. I like it. Right? That's one thing that would be enough to stand out. Find that one little thing, one little subtle detail, and boost it up and use it consistently. Right? This guy just decided to split himself into three parts, and every time you load the page, it's going to be randomly displayed with some random background color, and that's it. That's his signature. Right? It makes the site different than everything else. Here on Wark, if you remove all the animations and transitions, it looks like every single other website. Right? But this swooshy, silky animation that they have is the only thing that makes it so different. This is their signature, again. Or maybe sometimes the lack of animation or the lack of transition or delays could help as well. So here we've got elements appearing after each other with a certain delay with geometric forms appearing as a fallback. Uh, not fallback, as a um, placeholder. Right? So when you start throwing by, you can see them appearing slowly. Right? It looks great. This is, again, their identity. This makes them very unique, and this make, gives them a certain tone and voice. Or you can also play with your mascot, right? If somebody types in a password and so, just make sure, yeah, you know, it's secure. Don't worry. It's all fine. You don't have to worry too much about this, right? 
So there are many ways we can play, and I think that we just need to find that little thing that makes us different. Right? Again, it could be just a little visual treatment. It could be a little boring thing that's made funny or more interesting. Right? Or it could also be some, uh, you know, this little detail where you really pay attention to how it looks like and use it consistently. And this kind of brings me to the storytelling part because I feel that you know, we don't need to go overboard. It's enough if we're just consistent with our language and what we find, with our, how we define our design language. Right? But this is not good enough. We also need to provide a reliable, good experience. And this is where design patterns come into play. Right? Uh, we, not, we want to be usable, we want to be accessible. So I want to go through a couple of things which I use a lot. So every single time I use an accordion, for example, I'm going to stick to this rule, to these guidelines. And again, please feel free to break them. They're here to be broken. Right? But there are some things we discovered during research while working on the site. Now, welcome to the website with the largest number of accordions in the world. I went to all of them, well, websites, I went to all of them, and I found this one, which contains 129 accordions. Now you think, what's so hard about accordion? You click on the button, it opens. You know what an accordion is? We all do, right? You click on the button, it opens. You click again, it closes. You click on the button, it opens. You click again, it opens. Well, there are many, many things that can go wrong during this process. And I'm mentioning accordions here very prominently because I think that they're a very fundamental workhorse in our designs. Now, this is our good old friend accordion in slow motion, right? And you can display the entire card on large view. You can actually make it smaller on a smaller screen, right? And there are many different ways of how you can use it. Normally, we just think about the navigation. It can also be used, for example, when you're moving from one place to another. It could also expand and collapse. You can also use it for something like geometry or formulas, mathematical equations, where you can't display the entire equation, but you want to kind of keep and display the structure of the equation still, right? So if you go and resize it, or you just you know, tap on it, can actually make sure that the formula is more or less the structure, at least, of the formula is visible. Right? So anything that requires horizontal space could be collapsed as well, not necessarily vertically. Right? But of course, the more traditional way of how we see an accordion would be something like this, toggle, open, toggle, collapse. Right? So for every single thing, whenever I'm working on something, I try to come up with a checklist just because it's helpful. Don't worry, you don't have to take a photo. If you're searching for perfect design, perfect accordion, whatever, I published a series of articles on smashing. It, it's just one of those, right? And there are actually more questions than that. But there are so many questions we should ask ourselves before just using an accordion. Like, for example, you know, an accordion usually have, if you think about navigation, traditional kind of navigation like this, right? Where you have the guardian, and you have main categories, and you have subcategories. Now, there are tons of options. You can put the icon on the left, you could put the icon on the right, you could also inline it. You know, you could also, uh, what else can you do? You could, you know, there are many options when it comes to choice of the icon. Now, for example, how many of you would use a chevron? Like, let's say you have, again, these sections, news, opinion, sports, arts, life, and fashion, food, recipes, and so on are sub-items in the section live, okay? What icon do you use? Who would use a plus icon? To, like, let's say right here, next to life, here somewhere here, or here maybe, right? To indicate expansion. By default, it's collapse. Who would use a plus? Some people would use a plus, because they worked on a project that recently contained a plus. I get that. What about a chevron pointing down? Oh, more people. What about an arrow down? Okay, what about, what else can we do? Um, oh, it doesn't matter really. But what about, let's say, who would put it on the left? Next to life, right next to life. Who would put it on the right? Everybody else is like, who wants to go home? <laughs> or who just doesn't like to raise hands, maybe, for some reason? Um, yeah, it, it depends, right? Now, there are studies. And we did some tests. Now, there are many, many options. Like, if you look into it, well, what do you do? Well, the thing that we always used to do in the past, right? But why? So if we try to look, kind of test the options, we'll figure out that many people will click on slightly different spots when they click on that item, right? Many people will be confused, and many people will spend different amount of time finding what they're looking for. In that particular test, what Bidget discovered is that with an icon placed on the right, doesn't matter what icon we're using, users tend to click on the icon and not on the text. 
And all options with icons placed on the right resulted in slower task completion. Now, it doesn't mean anything, to be honest. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be putting icons on the right. The only thing it means is, because people focus on the icon, we should better make it big. So not because in these examples, in all these examples, that icon is quite small. But people focus on the icon. There is a good reason for it. Can you guess why, anybody? Because people used to be burned in the past. So if we look into this example again, here on The Guardian, right? Look at this example. Now, there are tons of options you can click on. You could click on the title, Life. You can click on the icon. You can click on the bar, right, in between. And of course, it depends on where the icon is placed. Now, we don't have consistency when it comes to this design. Like, we don't have consistency with accordions in general. How many of you had this experience? You click on the category's title to expand it, and all of a sudden, you land in a category page. Right? Some people have been burned. They don't want this experience. So if they don't know the website yet, they will not even try to click on the category. How many of you had this experience that you click on the bar, the empty bar, right, and nothing happens? Well, some of you. So people have been burned in the past. They don't want that experience again. They don't want to risk their time and lose their time to kind of have this experience. So for them, the icon is the bulletproof uh, option because it always works you click on the icon and then something should expand because this is what it indicates This is why people tend to click on the icon and not anywhere else, right? Doesn't matter if you're using left or right, but well it does matter a little bit But most of the time what matters is that we're using an icon that is really clear Sometimes you will find a plus Sometimes you will find Chevron sometimes you will find an arrow But we have to be a bit more careful about the choice of that icon now why? Now, welcome to the website with the largest feature comparison table in the world. This is really long. We will not have time to go through all of this. But what's really interesting about the site is that they are, for their pricing plans, let me see if I can find it, they're using this design, right? Now, can you tell me what would happen if you click on plus? Who expects expansion? Who expects sliding left or right? Nobody? Okay. Anybody else? Anything else? Who expects nothing to happen? Some people. So in fact, this, when you click on plus, nothing happens. Why? Well, because plus at this point stands for something else. It's not only expansion, it's also adding. So this is a bundle which contains push and life nine standard for this price. That's why it doesn't have to, obviously, like, uh, you know, toggle anything. But this is very confusing. And so once you, I mean, replacing it with end, for example, would be very helpful here, right? Just simple text. Now, many people would click on this plus because they've been in the past, they visited a website that, you know, contain a plus in the navigation and you can expand, right? This is not very clear. The other way, you know, plus could also mean something like zooming in, like on Leica, right? doesn't necessarily mean expansion at all, right? Or here, when you look at the chevron here, it's also very, uh, you will see, you'll find some people who will actually click on it just to think that it's a drop down that you can select something from. While in reality, it's an arrow that will scroll you all the way to the bottom of the page, right? So we have to be a bit more careful here. If you have a categories title, you better make sure that, like, of course, the entire thing is a tab and it acts as expansion. But you also need to include a link to the categories page, home page, under that accordion. Right? There are also more questions to ask. So should an expanded section collapse automatically once another one is clicked? Who would, like, you know what I mean? So you have a section which is expanded, and somebody else clicks on a section under it, which is you know, had not expanded yet, should the first one collapse automatically? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says I don't care? Okay, a couple of people. Well, you should care, because some people might be confused, right? So we have, this is a decision we have to, a, to ask ourselves, to make. And uh, for example, also, should the user be scrolled to top with expanded accordion? Let's imagine you cannot feel all the options on the screen. Some people will say yes, some people will say no. So I kind of developed a habit for every single thing that we're working on to develop some sort of checklist to go through the next time we have some issues. I need maybe like five more time, five more minutes. It's okay? All right. All right. Um, now there are also some in other interesting things that are happening. Accordion is like a workhorse, but navigation is another one. We always have some sort of navigation, right? 
For me, nice framework I'm using all the time is uh, the one from Jason Fried, which when, you know, when he spoke about it, this is not what he actually meant, I guess, but I'm kind of using it for my purposes. Every time we have a component, let's say like navigation, be it a mega drop down or something else, we try to break down priorities into three groups. He said, much of the tension in product development and interface design comes from trying to balance three things, the obvious, the easy, and the possible. Now, they're kind of weird to kind of break down this way, but once you kind of start thinking about it, it kind of makes sense. Obvious is stuff that you see all the time. Right? This is the expensive thing. There isn't much you can put on the screen to be visible all the time, be it on mobile or desktop or anywhere else. This is like the center of everything. The easy is you know, things that people tend to use frequently, but not all the time. Right? Think about something like, you know, probably like secondary, maybe even primary navigation. Right? People use it sometimes, but not all the time. While at the same time, hamburger icon is critical. It should be there. Right? Um, and then you also have possible things that people use sometimes, things like terms and conditions, for example, or contact, for, contact us, things like that. So once you break down the entire navigation into three parts, you can actually try to figure out how to display it properly. Here's an example for it. So here we have a worldwildlife.org. And that's a website that has a lot of navigation. If we look at the, uh, the top and the header, every single item, and there are like eight or nine of those, is a mega drop down. Well, there is a lot of content to organize, right? So what I decided to do, instead of actually just showing everything as is, kind of breaking out, prior not really caring that much about priorities, just showing everything at once, all the time, uh, instead, they break down everything into these three groups. Consciously or unconsciously, I don't think that this is the framework they were using, but this is kind of the idea that I have here. So you can say, okay, what is really important to us? What would make the experience really important for users, and how do we match it with the business needs? Right? So instead of just uh, reflecting that navigation one-to-one, -one, well, they just put donate link and adapt link at the top, extracting it away from the navigation, because this is what measures most of the business, right? which is, again, the obvious part. Then you find the easy part, which is the main sections of the site, right? And possible is pretty much everything else, right? I know it sounds very stupid and simple, but if you follow this through for every component, well, you will actually get the results which are much, much better and clearer in terms of um, like global overview of the components. I mean, at this point, we also have to think about how our users interact with this navigation, right? So because this is a study from three or four years, and yeah, we know that because we're using thumbs, right, most of the time. And in fact, many interactions, most interactions on mobile are driven by the thumb. And if we look into the design or usability of the thumb, we'll find out that some areas are more accessible than others. That's no wonder, be it left-handed or right-handed. For left-handed people, it would be just mirrored, right? Um, but we always find these areas which are just difficult to use. I mean, I have this hobby, which is a bit strange. Uh, I always, you know, you always have some time in the airport. And I like observing people using Facebook or other things. No, I'm, don't give, I'm kidding. Okay, well, I'm kidding. But it's always fun because very often you will find the people really struggling with accessing that hamburger icon. There is this magical moment where they're just you know, scrolling with a thumb, and then suddenly they can't access the hamburger icon. So there, this happens. They, they may maybe have a bag in the left hand or so. So the, hand, the, the bag goes down. It's been dropped on the floor. And then this happens. Like, uh, uh, right? So when you need to use the left hand. Now, this is probably not the best area, although maybe we should ask ourselves what would be the best area to put our hamburger icon. We put it in the left and right upper corner all the time. Is it a good idea? Hmm. If you have a delete button, let's say, which deletes a document, you probably don't want to be in the area, in the green area, where people can easily misstep, right? So you maybe want it to be somewhere between red and green, right? It's slightly different than tablets because we usually have a different posture when using tablets, right? So we use the tablet often when we're in bed, for example, and then the area at the bottom is dead. It's really, really difficult to use because we have our bellies, right? And so the area on the left edge and right edge is actually much easier to use, right? And in fact, the taller the device is, the smaller this blurb becomes, right? So what does it mean for us as designers? Now, we have pretty decent screens, high-resolution screens. We often use portrait. Although sometimes when it comes to video games or you know, galleries and things, we'll be using landscape, but mostly portrait. One-handed grip, thumbs are important, bottom controls easier to reach, which is why in many cases, be it in app design or be it in responsive design, 
in navigation kind of jumps to the bottom of the screen, right? Or not necessarily to the very bottom of the screen, but it's like a lot is happening in the last 30 to 40 percent of the screen. This is the real, like real primary area that we want to design for. And so some designers are actually experimenting with this place, uh, with this in mind. One of them is flip chart, flip chart, flip board. Flipboard, where everything, like the entire navigation, is actually happening at the last 30 to 40 percent of the screen. Another interesting example is Ada, which is a medical application, um, which allows you to track your medical in, uh, intake and your um, symptoms and so on and so forth. And so the first half of the screen, the first 50 percent, are totally blank because why would you put something in there? There is no need. Right? In fact, most of the stuff, or all the stuff is happening at the bottom. You'll find the logo at the bottom left, the side menu at the bottom right, and then everything is sliding from right bottom corner and not from left upper corner or right, bottom cor or right upper corner. Right? So this would be an interesting thing to explore. Right? And then finally, there is also one thing that I think is really, really cool and most people not use, don't use. Why don't we dedicate some spot on the front page why don't we dedicate some spot on the front page to actually highlight what we think is really important at the time? So Gov.uk does an amazing job at this. If elections are coming up, just display links to elections in the front page, right? That's way better than hiding somewhere in the navigation, right? The same happens here on DCA, where you just highlight prominently what actually is happening. And sometimes you can also use some visual help in order to indicate the shape of the product you're selling. So it's much easier to filter. There are four years between these screenshots. Now, this one was really difficult to find in Japan, right? Um, and I cannot finish the navigation part without talking about our good old friend carousels just for one more minute, because everybody hates carousels, right? And to, to be honest, so do I, but we can use a carousel meaningfully too, right? Now, I have to be totally drunk or crazy or so to want to click on one of these dots. Why would I want to click there? They're just ridiculous. The carousel pattern we're using is just a bit strange. So whenever I'm in a new city, in a new city, I always have this kind of weird thing where I try to find a theme, a random topic, and then I go and explore all the websites related to it. So when I was in Istanbul, I decided to make it the journey through carousel world. I saw a lot of carousels that day. It was a very sad day. It was a very, very difficult day. And surprisingly, and that's very interesting, you will never find that pattern that we're used to. In, in Turkey, right? There's also responsivejp.com, which is the showcase of responsive Japanese website, which is freaking amazing. You will never find dots there either, right? Instead, you will find lots, lots, and lots of numbers everywhere. And more button if you need to see more, right? That's a bit weird, but okay. And you'll find them all over the place, right? Now, this is my favorite example. Welcome to the carousel world. Welcome, exhibit number one, horizontal. Exhibit number two, vertical. Exhibit number three, with thumbnails. Exhibit number four, just a slider. Because, you know, a minimalistic carousel, if you like, right? And this is the horrible, 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 horrible experience that I will never, ever forget. This is so painful to watch. This is just incredible. So this is a, an airline website, and it's been redesigned since then, so that's great. But this is a carousel, and these dots over here is the only way to control it. At the bottom right corner, maybe five times five pixels or so. They're really small. Keyboard navigation doesn't work. It's just really, really sad. So sad. So sad. Right? And so we create passive-aggressive websites like this one. Should I use a carousel.com? Uh, where you always base it on data. And of course, the data is coming from this guy on the site with the first guy, university website. And this is what it looks like. So people tend to, use, to see the first image in the carousel, this most of them. The others maybe are lying. Then you look in the third, second, third, fourth, fifth position, they're kind of the same thing, right? 2%, 3%. I'm almost done, I promise you, right? And so you might think, well, we shouldn't use a carousel, right? That's just a horrible idea. I was working in the company, and then somebody comes to me and says, but I know a solution to this. He says, sure, I'm listening. He said, why don't we just randomly show an image on the front page? 
That's such a bad idea, such a bad idea, because if you pick a random image and display it in a carousel, you can just display a random image. You don't have to display it in a carousel. It's just horrible for performance. That's not good, right? And, but there is one thing that we should take away from this, too. And that's what something that I've been observing in e-commerce, because I did a lot of e-commerce work, a lot. And that's kind of weird. So it shows us two things. First of all, most people see the first image, which is obvious. But the second thing is, if you start going through the carousel, oh, yes, you go all the way. There is no way you're going to just stop at number three. When you started going to second and third, you will go all the way, even if it's like seven or eight, right? So the question now is, what do we as designers need to do to encourage somebody to go to see a second image? How do we make it better? Showing just a circle, half transparent circle, isn't going to make it. So one thing you can do, of course, is to give some context. Let's add some thumbnails and text and description and make it interesting, and so people actually use it. And yes, it actually does work in some scenarios, and it doesn't work at all in others. So just provide some context to make it a bit more memorable, uh, memorable a bit more usable, right? And it doesn't have to be a traditional carousel experience. You can also make it something like this, where you have a, I hope you can see it, oh, no, that's not what I wanted, where you can have a, mm, does it work? No. Where it's kind of flipping like a clock, you can, sorry, you can't see a video, but it's kind of flipping from like a clock because it kind of fits in with the brand, so it's like a full background thing. It's another carousel which is slightly different shape, right? So we can use it, it's just really up to us to figure out what would be the best way to do it. There's so many more things I could show, but I want to leave you with something that's kind of becoming this, have become a story for the last one and a half years of us experimenting and doing crazy things. You will never get things right, but we can at least try. And one thing that is really, really important, I think, is to just think about how we can make things maybe slightly better and find our personality in between. We can break things as long as they're accessible, right? The visual style can be whatever we want, but we can play with it and we can do something crazy with it. So this is the story of my life over the last one and a half years. We, no, not ready. Really. Can we turn on the audio, please? That's just sad. Oh. Thank you so much for Parallel Studio for it. So with this in mind, thank you so much for your attention. I hope it was useful, there's some parts of it. Please break things because we can repair it later. So thank you. Thank you, Vitaly. That was super cool. So there are lots of questions, and there's lots of lunch. Oh, yes, <gasps> lunch, right. And one of the big questions is, what the hell are you holding in your hands that makes this magical oh, it's presentation not, it's possible? Just, so there is, it's basically just a regular Logitech, Logitech thing. It's a new thing called um, Spotlight. Spotlight. It's, it's, it's like $100 or so. It's not that expensive. And it's actually pretty good. The thing is, if you had two screens or four screens, it could mimic whatever you do on, on here because it's kind of digital, uh -huh. right? Everywhere. That's the cool thing. Okay. Yeah. So there's the, uh, the magic wand you've been wondering about. Um, there's another question, and it's mostly about um, examples of fun stuff that also meets accessibility standards. 
What can yeah, you say I mean, about this? Uh, again, the same thing. In the 535 yes. slides you brought. <laughs> yes, the same thing that I actually said in the beginning was it's really important to keep an accessible markup. Everything should be accessible, but you can play a lot on top of it. Now, when we start working on a new component, whatever it's like, beta navigation or carousel, or whatever. It's always the same thing. We work in the, like, through the pyramid. When we write CSS, it's the same story. We always take care of accessibility first, performance. Then we have style, which is like responsive behavior and stuff. And then on top of it, you will find animation and quirkiness and whatever you want to add. But it always goes like this, very much like master of hierarchy of needs. So the foundation right. is accessibility. Yes, this is like it's all accessible, and then you start building on top of it. So Excellent. even if, you, if, if you, can, you can turn off things, so you can remove things and so on, it will still work. This is why the new site, for example, will work without JavaScript altogether, too. Not, not the checkout, to be honest. Checkout is still quite something. But um, the, all articles are accessible without, even without JavaScript, for example. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vitaly. Thank you.